Um, Virg Temi is an award-winning architect with a focus on environmentally responsible and energy efficient design, a leader in green design and lead certified projects in northeastern Wisconsin. She is an active member of the United States Green Building Council and is on the steering committee for the Climate Change Coalition of Door County. Virg received her Master of Architecture degree from the University of Illinois, Champaign, and has been a professional residential designer since 1988. Verge Temi Architecture Incorporated was founded in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin in 1999. You've also, if you've seen the sustainability issue, she has written for us this year and, and several times in the past and used to have a, a running column in the Peninsula Pulse. Um, so thank you for that, Verge. Hello. <laughs> yeah, so um, Amber and, and Mariah have covered a, a number of things that I'm gonna be covering, but I'm gonna take a little bit different tack. I think it's very wise to look at the history of how we got here and what's been done in the past to help us understand what we can do now in the future. So, you know, as Amber showed you, the housing shortage we're feeling in Door County is, is not, is shared throughout the world. Um, it's a global phenomenon. You can pick up a newspaper anywhere in the world and you'll hear, you'll read the same headlines, you know, that they have a lack of affordable housing. So how do we get here? Well, um, overall cost of construction has actually risen over 300% just since the 1950s, and that's in today's dollars. Um, and has doubled in just the last two decades. And truth be told, a lot of this has to do with consumer choices. HGTV was introduced in the mid-1990s. And about 10 years ago, we were uh, given house.com and Pinterest. That has driven a lot of consumer choices. You know, we've expected a lot more amenities out of our houses than we ever did before. And I'd like to compare, you know, what we were expecting in the 1970s houses and what we're expecting today. In the 1970s, homes were much more modest. They were smaller. They were about 1,400 square feet. They had one to two bathrooms that, oh, God forbid, the entire family shared. Uh, <laughs> We had very small kitchens, carpet and vinyl flooring were fine by everybody. You know, we had single load closets and small lots, usually just a 20 by 20 foot uh, two car garage. Today we have two to three bathrooms in every single home. You know, many homes have one bathroom for every single bedroom because God forbid your kids would ever share the same bathroom, right? We have cooks' kitchens with enhanced appliances. Um, every ba bedroom has to have a walk-in closet. Uh, we have two to three car garages, huge lots. And additional factors that are beyond the, the um, uh, consumer choices have affected our, house, our, our, effect, affected our housing costs. Um, for one thing, we had the housing bubble that hit us, um, and then it bust. In, in 2008, and so we entered the recession. And during a recession, nobody builds. People do not have the money to build. So spec houses weren't built. Affordable housing was not built. During that same time, our labor force shrank. People, young people don't want to go into the construction field anymore. And so contractors are having to pay higher and higher wages to a smaller and smaller pool of seasoned workers. The tariffs and trade wars of the last two years have also affected our, our bottom line on our construction costs. Mm -hmm. You know, these two elements alone have driven up the cost of materials over 15%. And, you know, as Amber noted, a lot of these homes are being converted to Airbnbs and vacation rental by owner. And so that's taken houses off the marketplace. But on top of all of that, something that hasn't really been mentioned before is that we are having increasingly powerful storms all around the globe, and that's affecting our housing costs too. Why? Because these storms are destroying houses that have to be rebuilt. Another factor is the house sizes and the household, uh, household sizes. So in 1970 or 1950, rather, um, we were perfectly comfortable to house families of three or four people in a 983 square foot home. We were very comfortable with that. Now, a family of two or three feels very pinched in a 2,400 square foot home. So that means the average square footage per person in just the last 50 years has increased by 328%. In Europe, the, cost, or the sizes of houses haven't increased as much as they have here in the United States. 
Um, but at the same time, the median income, of course, has flatlined for the average American worker. You know, the overall wealth of our nation has certainly increased, but we're not feeling it at the local level. We're not feeling it for the average, um, in the average household. But this is not the first time we've experienced this dilemma. Back in the 1940s, we were faced with the same thing. We had just come off the Depression. Nobody built during the Depression. Certainly nobody built affordable housing during the Depression because nobody had any money to build any housing. People were moving all over the United States looking for jobs, and everywhere they went, there were no more houses for them. There were no houses available for them. And then after World War II, troops came back, and there were no houses for them. People were living two to three families in a single home. People were converting, believe it or not, beer truck trailers and chicken coops to houses just to have a roof over their head. What the response to that was, the government got involved. The government funded projects, and private developers funded projects on very low-cost lands that the government helped pay for. And we, what the result of this was a complete shift in the housing paradigm. During this time, we invented plywood. We started building houses on slab on grade because uh, basements were too expensive. We moved garages from the back of the house up to the front of the house because it saved a couple hundred dollars on driveway costs. They pinched pennies every, every place that they could think of to reduce the cost of these houses so they became affordable to the masses. And so the resultant was all these lovely little Cape Cod houses uh, strewn throughout the entire United States. They were 24 by 32 feet, um, roughly 684 square feet, two bedrooms, one bath for families of three or four, and people absolutely loved them. I have interviewed people who lived in these houses in the 1940s that wept with joy for what they had compared to what they had before. During this time, we also rethought and re-engineered our neighborhoods. During this time, um, we converted from the grid system of neighborhoods that were very walkable to these very, very long lines of streets, uninterrupted streets. Um, and we did this for a specific purpose. First of all, you know, it saved money. It was cheaper to build this way. But also, you have to remember, we were in the Cold War at that time. We were terrified of atomic bomb attacks. And so urban planners specifically engineered these long, long, long interrupted streets so we could escape cities more rapidly and so we could find bomb shelters more rapidly. And so this legacy of the Cold War and the, and the, um, and the Depression were what encapsulated our thinking about housing and neighborhood planning for the next several decades. And that's what we're still faced with. However, we have the opportunity right now to create a completely different context. You know, the context we had at that time and up until recently has really been the legacy of the Cold War and the Depression. Our context now is quite different. We certainly have, you know, the affordable housing issue, the fact that people don't have much money, the fact that houses cost too much. But we're also faced with the fact that we have a warming planet and it's creating storms and problems, droughts all over our world. And so we have the opportunity now to create what homes will be for the future. We have, as, as Amber pointed out, we have three billion people by the year 2030 that are gonna be looking for housing. So we have a chance to change the way we've been doing things and bring some sense and forethought to the housing market. And architects, planners, and designers all over the world have jumped on this challenge. New materials are being invented. Uh, technology is in, being employed that we've never seen in the housing industry before. I just, I just read an article about uh, a company down in Australia that is pumping out, literally pumping out concrete houses using a 3D uh, imager, a 3D printer. And it uh, kind of looks like um, not silly putty, um, the kid's toy, the Play-Doh, Play Play like a Play-Doh yeah. extruder. Just, <laughs> and, they, and they create these homes in, in circular winding rows of concrete that go up in about three days. 
they have to finish them yet, but the basis is there. But all these people who have been working around, these thousands and thousands of architects and designers and planners around the world have all come to the same conclusion. <coughs> we have three elements that we have to think about, that we have to include in affordable, sustainable housing for our future. One, they must be small. We cannot continue to build these large houses. Two, we must rewrite zoning codes to allow for smaller lots and compact developments and three, these homes simply have to be energy efficient. And as Mariah was talking earlier about the tiny homes, you know, you've all seen pictures of them. They're little bitty houses that you can barely turn around in. And I personally think they're a fad and I think they're gonna go away. But the good thing is we do have a lot of, of um, movement towards smaller homes, houses that are about 1,000 square feet. You know, this is happening all over the world and especially we see it on the east and west coast of the United States making its way into the Midwest. Rob Vogel, who's a builder uh, down in Sturgeon Bay, uh, he and I are both independently working on uh, building and de designing and building 1,000 square foot homes for families of three or four, and hopefully at affordable prices. <laughs> um, Mariah mentioned earlier co-housing. This was actually a European concept that made its way to the United States in about, the 19th, or about 30 years ago. And it's, it's really taken off in certain communities. Uh, Madison has several co-housing projects. And the beauty of, of a co-housing project is the fact that it creates a community. It's intended to create a community. And what do communities do? They share tasks. In co-housing projects, they often share cooking, uh, they share gardening, they share maintenance, they share tools. They share child care, they shall share elder care. And what happens with that? Well, people save money. If you can barter uh, for tasks, for tools, uh, for all your needs, then of course it costs a lot less to live. Um, Mariah mentioned NeighborWorks over in Green Bay. NeighborWorks is uh, providing um, low cost opportunities for, for small and affordable homes. These are in the 170 to $250 range, which is unattainable by some people, of course, um, but it does fill the gap. Green Bay and Sturgeon Bay also are offering uh, lots at very minimal prices to builders who will come in and build sustainable, uh, afford or at least affordable houses. And then Green Bay, has a rehab program that I think is really quite unique and I would love to see other communities around here adapt the same thing. They gift these decrepit houses to the builders with the assurance from the builders that they will modify the homes, bring them up to current code, and sell them at an affordable price. Um, many families around Door County and around the United States are, are converting their larger single family homes to two family homes. And this was something that was used very widely back in the depression too. You know, not only to provide additional housing, but frankly, to subsidize the, the household income. It's a brilliant concept and heaven knows with all the big houses we have around Door County, um, we could probably maybe put five or six families in a house. <laughs> Um, another thing that we're doing, you're seeing more and more of that uh, in, in uh, Door County. In fact, I'm working on a project in Surgeon Bay right now that we're converting part of a, a commercial uh, building downtown to apartments. And two of them at least will be affordable apartments. And, um, and of course, you know, you see warehouses and factories all over the United States that are doing the same thing, you know, converting empty buildings into apartments and condos. But why do we keep hammering on energy efficiency for housing? Why is that such a critical element of that? It's because, it's because energy inefficient homes cost more, especially to low and middle income families. A larger percentage of their family budget goes into uh, paying for their, their utility costs. And I have, spoken to a number of families here in, in just in Door County that tell me that when winter comes, they move all the kids into their bedroom because they don't have enough insulation, the windows are leaky, and the house is too darn cold to heat, and they can't afford to heat the entire house. 
so they huddle in in just two rooms in their entire house. And I don't know, that strikes me as wrong. But why do we focus on buildings or why do we focus on, on energy? It's not just for the family's individual income and their individual budget. It's because buildings in general contribute over 30% of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it's the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that is warming our planet. If you look at the CO, if you look at these two charts right here, you can see the, the CO2 levels have really skyrocketed exponentially in, in just the last 50 years. And at the same time, take a look on the right. That's the number of catastrophic storms that are happening around this planet. The two are completely in sync with one another. And this next slide shows uh, fires caused by drought around the world just in the last few years. And I show these slides because all those catastrophic storms, the typhoons, the hurricanes, the, the flooding, the hailstorms, the, the um, destructive snowstorms that we've had just here in Wisconsin just this year, how many roofs collapsed. Between all of these elements that are caused by global warming, they're destroying homes. We're destroying hundreds of thousands of homes every year. That alone is drying up our resources of building materials. That's additionally driving up the cost. That's why we have to build energy efficient homes. And how do we do that? Well, we build smaller, we keep the shapes simple, we stretch the living spaces, um, putting multiple uses in a single room, a multiple space, multiple places in a space. Um, we integrate the interior and the exterior so the home feels larger. We optimize the design using computer, uh, computer modeling to make sure that before it's built, we have the most energy efficient house. And um, we site for solar gain. Uh, we make sure that we can pull in all the passive solar and active solar that we possibly can. The reason being, what we're trying to do is eliminate the CO2 in the atmosphere by eliminating the need for fossil fuels. <coughs> and there are different pathways that uh, we, can, we can use to get there. Focus on Energy is a program, these were all developed within the last 30 years, Focus on Energy. That was a good start. It was an okay start. You know, it improved energy efficiency about 15%. And it was third party testing. So it kicked us up a little bit of a notch. Um, the Department of Energy has created a zero energy ready homes program. And that brings homes up to about 40 to 50% better than code, which is a huge step forward. Uh, LEED is a comprehensive sustainability program that deals not only with the energy of the house, but also how the site is developed, where the site is located to eliminate uh, unnecessary trips back and forth in your car, for instance. Um, Passive Woofy is another program that was actually uh, developed over in Germany when they were uh, going through their gas shortages back in the 1980s and 90s. And that is a computer modeling program that is designed to create homes that are 90, 95% more energy efficient than code requires. And the living building, building challenge is, I think that is the next huge leap for us to take. Um, the living building challenge, its, its mission is to, to design the building so they actually give back to the environment more than they take from the environment. And I've only just started learning about this in the last two years and there are I think maybe three maybe three buildings in the entire United States that have qualified for uh, living building certification. But it's something that if you, if you have time, if you have interest, it's something you should look into and something we should be looking at for future, house, or future housing because it saves water, it regenerates water, it saves and regenerates electricity, it saves and regenerates our flora, um, our plants. It's, uh, it's a program I think that is gonna be really critical in the future. 
So look at Door County. So we have a legacy of small homes. We already have that. We have a legacy of loving nature. And so I think Door County is a prime candidate for making this transition into what buildings should be for our future. I'm showing here two examples of certified passive houses. And if I didn't have that title up here, you would not know that these are anything but typical Door County houses, right? These look like anything that you would see on our landscape. However, both of these houses were certified. They both produce, they're almost net zero energy, both of them. They are carbon neutral, they're healthier, um, and, uh, and they're very, very comfortable homes to live in. So the question is always raised, how much does this cost? You know, surely energy efficient homes are a lot more expensive than standard construction. Well, I beg to differ with that. Um, the homes that I have been designing and building for the last several years, uh, we maintain records of them. And I'm giving you an example of just a 2,400 square foot home that we built up in Gil um, Gills Rock about eight years ago. We've been kind of monitoring the, the energy use on that house. And we also documented the difference between the cost of that house using a standard construction and doing what we did to make it an, uh, a near net zero energy home. It's now a net zero energy home because we, uh, we installed just a 4.6 kilowatt solar panel system on it. Very small solar panel system. It's an all electric house, no fossil fuels used. But on a standard construction, we'd have two by six walls. We'd have R19 fiberglass insulation in, in the walls. We'd have an R34 roof, R10 on the foundation, standard air ceiling, res check modeling, which is baseline modeling, um, standard HVAC. At that point, if we had built this house using standard construction, it would have had an 80,000 BTU furnace, a big furnace for a 2,400 square foot house. What we did was we used uh, double stud walls. We had R45 insulation, all cellulose. We doubled up the insulation on the roof. I modeled it using Passive House software. R20 on the foundation, we had optimum solar gain. Uh, it was on a meadow. Uh, it got great sunlight on the south side. And of course we had solar shades, sun shades on the south side of the, the building to keep it cool in the summer. Um, <laughs> with the modeling and what, with what we did uh, with insulation, we came down to, um, actually we came down to almost 9,800 uh, BTUs on the house, but because we can't go that low on heating systems without transitioning to something that you would use in a mobile home, we had 11,200 BTU furnace in there. Now the construction cost for this house, the way we did it was, came to $100 a month more for a 30 year mortgage. But with the energy savings, they actually netted a gain from the very first month they moved into that house. It was paying them back $32 every month. And can that be done for, um, can that be done? I mean, that was a 2,400 square foot house. And the question is, can that be done on a smaller home? Well, we've been documenting uh, the little sage house that I did in Sturgeon Bay. And um, I would say that we have a really good chance. You know, if you start looking at the life cycle costing of buildings, rather than just the bottom line and then, and then your utilities, you're actually saving more money by building sustainably and building an energy efficient house than building standard construction. So this is what we need to convert to if we're gonna do affordable housing. And Amber knows and she agrees. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so there are financing programs that are available. Um, the government, um, the government has created a PACE program for uh, commercial projects for developers. Um, Fannie Mae has uh, their smart housing program, uh, their homestyle energy program. Uh, they can subsidize mortgages. If you have additional costs to make your home energy efficient, then they will help subsidize the cost of that mortgage. Uh, Wisconsin Focus on Energy has money available to retrofit your home for, more, for better energy use. Uh, and um, money back for, for new homes as well to make them more energy efficient. 
And uh, actually, Amber shared this slide with me, and I had to, slide, I had to share it with you. Um, every year, um, global green grades are, are given for, um, for how well we're doing with encouraging green building in affordable housing. And Wisconsin last year was one of only two Fs given. And a lot of this had to do with the fact that our legislature doesn't, didn't, and probably at this point still doesn't, promote uh, green concepts and energy efficiencies. But I look at this as a challenge. I figure we have nowhere to go but up, <laughs> and, and we will get there. <laughs> so, thank you.